Just told me. Yeah. Baptism before Jesus. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I've been juggling a lot this morning, so we're just about ready to roll here. You had a you had a birthday party in your family last night. We did. We Big. did. We celebrated Katie's twenty eighth birthday. So. <laughs> Twenty eight, man! You're old enough to have a kid. Twenty eight? No, it's it's freaky weird. <laughs> <laughs> Wait until you're old enough to have a son retired from the navy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Son retired from the navy. Oh my! <laughs> All right. Well, good morning. Welcome. Good to see everybody here today. On a beautiful day. Yes, for those who just are checking in, um, uh, we'll be getting a, there's a Caring Bridge site that we just, we set up that I just sent an email out on. So you can extend Randy prayers and thoughts and, and we'll have a, you know, we'll put some, we'll put updates on there. So you can always check into that. Um, Randy, of course, is getting a ton of calls and, and, and lots of people, which is good. And, um, there's an appointment this morning that's important um, that Randy's having at the neurologist, and then we'll be putting out some, you know, an update this afternoon. So we'll just keep her and keep praying for her and and Randy um, in this in this time. So uh, all right, so we are um, we are going to tackle uh, Bob's suggestion, <laughs> or I think this was Bob's suggestion. I don't know if this is exactly what Bob was thinking about, but, but and this is a question I often get is, um, oh, and welcome to the Facebook Live people too. So great to have you with us. Um, we, I'm often asked, well, is baptism a Christian invention? Is this something that, you know, um, people in Jesus's day would have been, you know, taken back by? Um, and so, you know, let's work with that a little bit. We'll look at some important texts here from the Old Testament and, and actually some from the New Testament that refer to the Old Testament. Um, so in one sense, we might call this baptism's Old Testament pedigree. But uh, really the question that I thought about, and then I just want to cite one of my sources, because there's so much out there, and there's a podcast on 1517 uh net where they have a whole bunch of podcasts and uh, uh there's a person named chad bird that i've been listening to a bit and he's done some good good work on a lot of a lot of important topics um agree with everything he does of course or anything like that but he, he's done some solid work and uh so i'm borrowing some of of his work on this but really it's all available um in lots of places. So, so we're going to look at baptism's Old Testament pedigree. Let me say a prayer here, and we will we'll roll. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for this day, every day we get to have, and we give thanks for your word, and we give thanks for baptism as we are on the heels of celebrating Jesus's baptism and the word that came to him in baptism, um, and we give, continue to cling to and appreciate our baptisms um, as well. So help let this time be fruitful and help us to have even greater appreciation of this gift that you've given us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So I'm going to share my little Bible study screen. And I'm going to move this over here. So I'm going to put the Bible text on the left side. Um, so if you want to put all the people on the right side, there's ways you can do that. Like if you press that big waffle, uh, those that looks like a Rubik's cube kind of, 
um, that that'll put all the people up there and you can kind of shrink that uh, it, it depends if you if you're on a phone or an iPad it's it's more difficult but if you're on a computer you can kind of put people on the right and and put the text on the left here so um, I'm going to go to Genesis 1, believe it or not, to start us off. I hope. Oh. oh, I see what's going on. Okay, let's get rid of this. And that one will go here and go here. This should, should get us in the right spot. Okay, so when we start thinking about baptism, uh, we think about water. And so when we think about water, we can think about Genesis 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. So, so we've got God's spirit brooding, the wind, the voice of God brooding over the waters. Um, and then God says, let there be light. And God said, and the light was good, and God separated the light from darkness, called the day, light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning on the first day. And then God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so, and God called the dome sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let dry land appear. And so, it, and it was so, and God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth be put forth vegetation, plants, yielding seed, fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit. And he goes on. Um, then, um, you know, he, the, the, there's lights in the dome of the sky to separate day and night. And then we've got that going on. Um, and then let's get down to verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. Um, so we've got water all over this creation story and God bringing life out of water. And so that is, you know, obviously it's not talking exactly about baptism, but that's an important grounding um, text when we think about God's right from the very beginning was bringing life out of the water. Um, and this will not go uh, unnoticed by some of the early church fathers. Uh, how many of you have heard about Justin Martyr? I don't know if you've heard about him, but he, he goes back to, what was it, 120 AD or somewhere in there. Um, and he's martyr is his last name because he was martyred. And he's one of the early church fathers. We have a number of his writings um, that were highly regarded in the early church, not as scripture, but highly regarded. And he talks about how the symbol of the what? What was one of the first symbols for Christians? Fish. There you go. The ick. And uh, I didn't pull it up for you. I, I suppose I, I could have had I better had been more prepared. But if you take as an acrostic, um, the first letter of the word ichthys in Greek, um, Christ um, is the, the chi is the first, um, uh, you know, letter in ichthys. And then if you go down with all the letters, it's, it's um, Christ, um, and then the word for uh, theos, um, God, Son, sa um, Savior. Um, so you get the fish being this early uh, symbol for Christianity. Um, we see the fish a lot in the catacombs in, underneath Rome that date back to the early days of Christianity. And so even though the acrostic works, 
and there's the legend of one person drawing one side of the fish and the other person drawing the other side to make sure, you know, that was a secret way to, you know, say that you were Christian. Um, uh, even though that's, you know, a legend and probably is, there's some truth to that. And even though there's this acrostic, it works very well as an ancient Christian confession, we see it rooted here in Genesis where God brought life out of water. So that, of course, is not the only um, passage, um, but that's an important place for us to start. So now I'm going to take us to 1 Peter 3, 18. So if you've got your Bible and you want to go to the New Testament, if my uh, deal here will 1 Peter 3, 18. There we go. So in 1 Peter, we're going to hear a reference now to another important, um, another really important uh, text in the Bible. Um, and Peter in the New Testament is going to refer back to the Old Testament. So let's kind of pick this up here at verse 18. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteousness for the unrighteous, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. I, you know, you can see I've got this highlighted. This is one of my, you know, favorite uh, passages. When it, you know, one of those sum up the gospel passages. Christ also suffered for sins once for all. Um, Jesus' suffering and death on the cross was not just a, hey, look, this is the way you should lay your life down in the world. Go imitate Christ. That's certainly true. Um, but no, it was for something, and it was for our sins. This is a, a foundational Christian conviction um, all over the New Testament. Um, once for all, a one-time event, the righteous, so Christ was righteous, for the unrighteous, in order to bring us to God. So we are the unrighteous Christ, the righteousness. He did that for us to bring us to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. That's that mysterious verse we've spent a lot of time with, and we could spend hours on just that verse. That's kind of the foundation for our apostles' creed, he descended to the dead, or descended to hell, who in former times did not obey. When God waited patiently, uh-oh, now here comes another biblical story, in the days of Noah. So now we got a reference to the Noah story, and, you know, we probably don't need to be reminded of the Noah story, but God, so we'll just let um, Peter tell us about that. Eight, per, That is, eight persons were saved through what? Water. Water. And then, you know, and you could say, well, what does that have to do with baptism? Well, Peter jumps in there and says, and baptism, which is prefigured. So now the flood of Noah prefigures baptism, our baptism. Now saves you, not as just removing dirt from the body. I think there's maybe a thought to how, and we'll get at We'll talk about mikvah, mikvahot or mikvah, um, the ritual baths of Jesus' day that first century Judaism was very um, into and very popular. Um, I don't know if there's a reference to that or not there, but, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Now, I know that's a little vague, or what does that mean? But, but our baptism, um, and then note, through the resurrection of Christ. So, you know, the Apostle Paul will say that in our baptism, we are connected to Christ's death, and also then we will share in a resurrection like his, that we're connected to Christ. So when we are baptized and connected to Christ, now there's an appeal to God. We have his righteousness, and we can have a good conscience. We don't have to be oppressed by our sin anymore through the resurrection of Christ. So note that right from the beginning, here's the Apostle Peter connecting baptism to the flood story in the Old Testament. So Peter, if he was here talking to us and we asked him, hey, well, what's the background of baptism? What He'd say, hello, think about the flood. 
<laughs> fun. Now I, I noted that Don Jukum, his uh, our one of our retired pastors who's, who's been writing at quite a few of our or doing a, quite a few of our weekly devotions, and I've really been enjoying those. Um, he had one recently on numbers in the Bible and just whetting our appetite about that. And and um, how many persons were there? Eight. Eight. When was Jesus raised from the dead? Third day. On the eighth day. <laughs> Seven days a week, the eighth day, he was raised. Oh, <laughs> Did you know how many sides that, have, uh, that Silverdale Lutheran's baptismal font has? Eight. Eight. <laughs> so um, a lot of Christian thinkers and rulers and just Christians in general and a lot of the ancient Christian writers, when Peter talks about eight persons and we talk about the eighth day, we talk about the eighth day of the day of the resurrection. So here, let's, Peter makes a connection. So what's the, what's happening in this event of Noah? It puts, you know, although, you know, many people died, except for eight pe persons, according to the story, because of their evil and their wickedness and, and whatnot, but it put something to death and saved lives. It saved life, not just human beings' lives, but it saved the the whole covenant, the whole creation, that there would be still human beings on the earth. So um, the view here is that God brings life out of the water, Genesis 1, and now brings life out of the flood. Uh, I wonder if I could even search for something here. Let me, let me try. Oh, come on, where's my search button? <laughs> I don't want to search the Bible. I want to just do a, there, here it is. I want to just do a total search. I'll put you guys over here for Luther's flood prayer. It's been raining so hard lately. I was wondering if we should be building another ark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, it's not going to be in this. Though. <laughs> Um, Martin Luther is uh, famous uh, for writing, um, let's see, let's see here if I can find Ah, here we go. Let me uh, float this panel here, if I can. Load it. Ah, there we go. And bring this here. And see if I can move you guys over here so I can read it. <laughs> All right, so this is... Um, in Luther's order of baptism from 1526. Almighty and eternal God, who according to thy righteous judgment did condemn the unbelieving world through the flood and who disdrowned hard-hearted Pharaoh with all his hosts in the Red Sea. So this is gonna kind of preempt where we were going, but so now we've got the Red Sea involved and dislead thy people Israel through the same on dry ground thereby prefiguring this bath of thy baptism, and who, through the baptism of thy dear child, our Lord, G dear Jesus Christ, has consecrated and set apart the Jordan. So now we get the Jordan. So we're going to be talking about the Jordan River, too. And all water as a salutary flood and full washing away of sins. We pray thee through the same groundless mercy that thou wilt graciously behold this, and then the person's name is read, and bless him or her with true faith in the Spirit, so that by means of this saving flood, all that has been born in him from Adam, and which he has added thereto, may be drowned in him and engulfed, 
and that he may be sundered from the number of the unbelieving, preserved, dry, and secure in the holy ark of Christendom. So there's different renditions of this. We had one in the LBW that was oftentimes read. We didn't read it all the time because um, it's long and you got a baby crying. <laughs> so it can be challenging. But um, so here you go. This is all going to, would the, what, what were the people going out to be baptized by John? Were they like, why are we doing this? Or did it make sense to them? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of grounding now for God using water to bring um, forth new life. And so all of these things set the stage um, for uh, the practice of Christian back, baptism. And we're going to talk now more about intertestamental stuff. But let me just pause here because I've been doing a lot of talking and see if there are any folks who, um, you know, want to add something or some uh, an insight that, you know, you have um, or a question you have about what we've read so far. Or, you know, you add an insight. Or I'm totally open to that. Love it. So they were dunking him, were they, they, at that time, three times? Well, um, the practice of three times is a Christian thing. But, uh, you know, there were different kinds. The mikvaot were big, big baths, like, like tiny little jacuzzi type <laughs> size things. So whether they went all the way under, I don't know. Um, you know Again, we'll we'll talk about that, you know, that shortly. So yeah, good. Any any thoughts on those two passages with the flood and Genesis one and our own baptisms? All right. All right. I like how um Genesis links so strongly the spirit and the water too. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the spirits hovering over the waters, and so that's you know, and then when Jesus himself is baptized, the spirit descends upon him. We've, we've worked with that last week when we looked at the baptism of Jesus and manna. Um, so yeah, good, good. Let's think of some other Old Testament stories and let's go to anybody else though, before I keep us going here in a text. All right. Let's see here. Oh, I see what I did. I want to go this way. All right. Um, I want to go over here to um, 1 Corinthians 10. Again, I'm going here to uh, look back at the Old Testament because this is, um, you know, this is a reference to Old Testament stuff. So you remember numbers, the people are wandering around and Moses is there. So um, We've seen already that water God puts to death and brings to life, um, saves. Uh, he brings forth life from water. Well, now we've got this passage here, Roman, uh, 1 Corinthians 10. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were under a cloud and all passed through the sea. Oh, all passed through the sea. Okay, so what passage are we talking about now? Um, the Red Sea. When Moses, you know, got, took care of the Pharaoh, he, he parted the waters, brought the people forth from slavery into freedom. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So notice Paul now, he doesn't see if a lot of times I've talked to some folks who say we're artificially making this connection between Christian baptism or baptism and the um, Old Testament, that we're just comparing stuff with water. That, well, the Apostle Paul and Peter now have put together, talked about baptism and water crossing together. So they were all baptized into Moses. So, so what we see by the time of the New Testament is the concept of baptism was already there. Um, and again, we'll get to some stuff more current to Jesus in a minute. But so all were baptized into Moses in the cloud 
That was the pillar of cloud that led them, and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. This is probably a reference to the manna. And all drank the same spiritual drink. Remember when Moses hit the rock and water came forth? Okay. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So here's a passage where, you know, we see Paul connecting Christ and talking about the Exodus as a kind of baptism. Hmm. Now, yes, they were still in Moses, and they were struck down in the wilderness. They didn't keep the law, and, and he goes on. Um, uh, and, but, but this is an important text because it reminds us of yet another story where water was used and referred to as a baptism. Okay? Good work. Now, let's keep going. I want to do a quick search for a certain guy. I didn't grab the text. Um, am I spelling Naaman wrong? Why is it Naaman coming up? Search the entire Bible. Man. 1A. Ah, two A's. <laughs> okay. There um, he is. <laughs> all right, there he is. So we want to go now to Second Kings. My deal will go there. Second Kings 5. Let's just, okay, let's stop that. We're going to go Second Kings 5. There we go. All right, so this is a great story, one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament, uh, where there's a lot of stuff about water. So Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, If only my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, and that's Elijah, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went and told his Lord just what the girl from Israel had said. So the word gets to Naaman. So he went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, um, and he brought a letter to the king of Israel. This is the northern kingdom. When his letter reaches you, know that I've sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. So of course, the king of Israel thinks this is horrible. He's picking a fight. He wants to go to war with me. He knows I can't cure him. But when Elisha, sorry, this is Elisha now, not Elijah, the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that I may learn, that, there, that he may learn there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go wash in the what river? Jordan. The Jordan River. Now, I know there weren't that many rivers around. <laughs> there were lots of bodies of water, lots of streams, lots of stuff like that. But no, go wash in the Jordan seven times. Whoops. Didn't want to do that. Here. There we go. Seven times. Um, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. So now, here's this story, go wash, and be clean. Of course, Naaman gets angry because he's not treated with the right royal credentials and all this, and he could have washed somewhere else. And the servant 
fortunately says, hey, if he had told you to do something difficult, wouldn't you do that? And so he goes and he does it. When he returned to the man of God and his company, he came and stood before him and said, I know there is no God in earth that you judge Israel. Please accept a present from your servant. Because when he did that, the flesh became that as the flesh of a young boy, and he was made clean. So he's furiously angry here, and then he washes, and he sees now God is the true God. Um, he even asks for some, to take some of the dirt from Israel home so he can keep worshiping God, even though he has to go in the house of Ramon, um, a, you know, one of the foreign gods, even though he has to go there with that king, um, he, he's going to worship now the one true God. An amazing story, an amazing story. Now, when the people, let's go back before Naaman, the waters of the Red Sea, right? They, they went through. That's like one bookend. And then how do they enter Israel? Do they come up through the south when they take the land? No, they come, they go up on the east side of the Dead Sea and go up, and then they come in. And of course, Jericho's the first battle, but what happens? They go through the Jordan River. So you've got two bookends. Red Sea, they're going to the wilderness, they're set free. But then when they're brought into the promised land, you've got another water crossing. And so, and now Elisha tells Naaman, go wash in this water um, and you will be made clean. So now not only is life coming out of water and, you know, something's put to death, and raised up to life in water, but now we've also got this sense of a cleansing. Um, and so that's, that's really an important background when it comes to baptism. Um, going back to Peter and to where he says, um, let me go back to 1 Peter. Not Peter 31. <laughs> My fingers aren't working today. Um, let's see. Notice we get the sense now of a cleaning. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. So that, that, now I want to go into um, what was happening in baptism in Jesus' day. And, you know, would people have been weirded out by the fact, you know, would it be strange that John the Baptist is out there on the Jordan River baptizing people? Um, let's see. Let me just see if I can do a search here on this back book. Or Mikvah. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> Let me see if I can pull up some media here. So, uh, can you see some of these pictures here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are they too small for you? Here, let me click on this one. Maybe it'll make it bigger. There. Here we go. So this is one picture among many. And you can you can move the people around a little bit on your screen if you need to. But you can see some steps here. And I believe this is one that they found at um that is located at Qumran. And so Qumran was a was the place out by the Dead Sea where we think we're quite confident that most of the Dead Sea Scrolls were composed or, or scribed and, and then hidden up in the caves in the Dead Sea. But this community um, of first century Jewish people, very devout Jewish people, out there in the desert had these 
ritual baths. And you can see the steps going down in, and you can see about the size. And for a, a mikvah to be the ideal, there would be running water. When um, those of us who went to Israel went to the town of Magdala, um, and this is a town that existed in Jesus's day, uh, um, it was unearthed just in, you know, what, 2008, I think, or something like that. My, my memory's getting foggy somewhere in there that they actually even discovered the town. And since then, it's been, you know, archaeology is, and it's been excavated, and they found a first century synagogue. A lot of people didn't think that actual synagogues existed in Jesus's day, that it was just houses. Well, that's pretty much <laughs> blew that little theory out of the water, so to speak. Um, because it's right there. Um, we can see it. Um, we, and Jesus preached in all the synagogues, according to the Gospels, of the, around the Sea of Galilee. We don't hear about the town of Magdala, but we do hear of Mary of Magdala, of course, famous disciple of Jesus. Um, so, uh, you know, um, we know he preached there. We know he walked there. You can go and stand right next to the door where he walked in and preached 2,000 years ago. Well, guess what they also find um, in the town of Magdala is a number, not just one, but a number of mikvah. And the mikvah, to be ideal, would um, have running water. And so what we can see really clearly in Magdala, it's a cool thing because it's so close to the Sea of Galilee, um, the, these, they have to keep pumping out these um, mikvah because now that they've excavated them, um, they fill up with water just naturally because they put it into the water table and, and, the, and, the, and so they fill up with water. So when I've been there in Magdala, um, you know, they've got these big pumps pumping water out into the Sea of Galilee because the water is naturally coming up with them. So, so what we know about first century Jewish practice of from the Talmud and other Jewish writings, is that there was a practice that before you went into the synagogue, you would go down and you would bathe and wash and clean yourself. Um, maybe you were ritually unclean because of some of the things in the Levitical code that make you ritually unclean. Um, you would do that. But we also, and here's what's really interesting, um, we also know that Gentiles would be required to be baptized when they became Jews. So there was a rite that marked the transition of a Gentile into the people of God. And then there was this practice of actual baptisms, in essence. Now theirs was a continual practice, and that's where that first Peter text I wanted to read today was so, it's so important. Um, because, you know, not as a washing away of dirt, like all those mikvah baptisms that you do, but a once for all connection to Christ. So, um, you know, baptisms were around. I'm going to unshare my screen here for a minute. So baptisms were around and plentiful, um, and we know that they were done for various reasons. And so now let's go back out to John the Baptist, because we've, we've heard plenty of times recently the passages about John baptizing out at the Jordan. Why at the Jordan? Would that be weird to the people? Like, why would they be going out there? Well, one, I think it is interesting. A lot of scholars make a point that the things don't get started in Jerusalem, that gets out in the wilderness, because wilderness is, is so rich with symbolism in the um, Hebrew scriptures. But also... The Jordan River is really important, isn't it? Why? It's the water crossing into the promised land. Right. So, you know, where else would John be to start off this new covenant? But out in the Jordan. Um, and so he's out in the Jordan. We don't know exactly where. Um, there's a couple of sites that are you know, promoted and, and likely for sure. Um, but... He's in the Jordan baptizing, and all the people are going out there, and that's where Jesus's ministry begins. 
Um, so, you know, baptism before Jesus, you know, it was a common practice. It's got a ton of background in the Old Testament, which I haven't exhausted all of the stories by any means, um, uh, of where God used water with his word, his actions included water, um, and the New Testament connecting, using baptismal language to talk about those events. So I think that's fascinating. And then obviously we want to talk about, well, what's the ramifications for our baptism? And I want to hear from you what, like, okay, so what does this tell me about my baptism and, and, and how it functions in my life and, and whatnot. But, but so just to finish this off, um, in the temple also in Jerusalem, or not in the temple, but recently, again, some of these um, finds are more recent, on the southern steps of Jerusalem, I could probably share my screen and, and put some pictures of that up as well. Um, so we got that share going. Let me move my beloved people over to the right now here. And I'm going to go, um, let's see, find media. And I'm going to go southern steps if they can give us some see if they can give us some no results hmm. no results that's impossible well, that's because southern is spelled wrong is it really yeah yes. you've got an r in there yep. ah, so sour, sour, sour sour then no we don't want sour steps <laughs> southern steps there you go. I was going to say, there's got to be something in here about Southern Steps, but I still didn't get anything. No results. Oh, search, because I'm searching. I got to go back here now. Let's go back. So now we'll do Southern Steps. Okay. Yep. There you go. Here we go. And let's use, well, you can see right here, this is one of the mikvah that they unearth right around the southern steps. Um, I'm going to put you guys over here. Oh, it's taking time to load. So this is a, a great picture of the southern steps. Uh, again, those of us who went to Israel got to go and stand there. Um, but you can see this kind of entrance here, and there's another one over to the right of the photo. And these are entrances that were open in first century um, Israel and in Jesus's day. This was a, one of the entrance. And these were the southern steps by which Jesus would enter Jerusalem and enter the temple. The temple's just right near on the other side of the wall there. Um, and the lower, uh, especially these lower um, big stones were the ones that Herod the Great had erected for the big um, retaining wall um, of the temple mount that he created. So these were the southern steps that Jesus walked up and down. And right in this, these areas here, um, we've unearthed mikvah. So people would um, bathe before they would go into the temple. So the practice of bathing, of a kind of baptism, was certainly very well known in, in Jesus's day. The use of, um, the use of, I'm going to stop the share here, the use of water with word and God using water to perform actions um, is obviously well attested. So um, with that, that's just some great kind of background um, when we hear Jesus want one, Jesus being baptized, but then in Matthew 28, Jesus says, go baptizing everyone in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. So Jesus' charge, he's giving all authority, he's been given all authority, and he now commissions us, and his commission is to baptize. Um, so, wow, all right, that's cool. So, so where I want you to take the story from here. Um, you know, what's the so what to this? And then I also want to go back to Bob at some point <laughs> and say, 
is this what we were getting at? You know, <laughs> are we answering some of the questions that um, that came with that? But yeah, so Ethel May, please. Um, a number of years ago, I'm trying to figure in my head. That was so, a friend and I went to um, Tacoma to a Catholic church on the eve of Easter when there are a lot of of these uh, Easter vigils held. And this Catholic church in Tacoma, which I think was relatively new, not the old one that they're debating about, but it had inside the sanctuary a baptismal font just like the one you showed with steps going down. And at the point of the evening when we finally decided we had to leave, they were just starting baptism. So the priest was getting into the pool and the the candidates for baptism were getting into the pool and it just um it was so exciting but we it was after midnight and we had to be up for 6 a.m <laughs> choir so <laughs> we decided to take three hours of sleep we didn't stay for the whole thing yeah. really um it, it just uh, it, it's really impressive when you see what was done in the holy land and in jesus time and that we can um copy that in that way it's very meaningful for sure yeah. But on the other hand, I was baptized in November as a baby, and I'm glad it wasn't a wading pool at that time. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of head, water on the head was enough. Yeah, it would have been a little chilly. A little chilly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, Doug. Yeah, uh, I like to think of um, when we're talking about this baptism and, and the water cleansing uh, of the uh, John chapter 13 where Jesus washes the feet of his disciples and he gets to Peter and Peter says, you're never going to wash my feet. And then Jesus, um, I don't know, maybe you want to read some of it. But, um, well, Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. So Peter seems to be saying, well, then wash all of you. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's, I think you know where Jesus goes with that after, too. So it's yeah, and, and so you know, water is so, is, you know, what all of this talk, all of this in water from the Old Testament to the New is about cleansing, because that's what water does for us. I mean, we wash our dishes, you know, <laughs> to clean it. And then we wash ourselves to clean ourselves. Um, yeah. Seems to so be... It's a it's a great connection to a washing away the sin of the world. <laughs> washing away our sin, for sure. That's right. And that's why, Doug, when we talk about remembering our baptism, like it's cool that we have water that you can put on your forehead um, pre-COVID, of course, uh, um, to remind yourself of your baptism as you come to receive the Lord's Supper, because in essence, baptism brings you into the gift of the forgiveness of sins which the Lord's Supper gives. Um, so, so that's kind of a cool practice. Just, and that's somewhat unique to SLC. Most, most churches, when they have people putting, you know, touching or remembering their baptism, it's in the front, it's in the narthex or something as they come into church. And it's certainly a good place to, to do it there as well. Um, yeah, so that's true. I'm glad you brought up that question about Peter and the washing of his feet. And you, uh, one other thing, and I forget the details on this, but in the ancient world, I've read that feet and hands were also symbolic for, um, and then your voice, uh, they're, they're like three zones. And feet and hands represented your actions, your, your life, your, your work. And so Jesus is saying, hey, because afterwards, Jesus says, oh, your feet are all that's necessary. So in other words, you know, um, you know, that's what you need to have, you know, washed. Um, so, so not only is there a kind of example setting function to that story, Doug, which I think you would have, you know, and so I'm glad you brought that up. There is a kind of maybe a sacramental illusion there. And I think that happens a lot in the, in John. Yeah, Kathy. Yeah, along those same lines, when when they were using the mikvah on the way to the temple, do you have, is there any historical information about what they did wash? Were they just washing their feet or, you know, were they submerging or what? Yeah, they, um, to the best of my knowledge, as I've read, um, and especially given how big the baths were, 
um, they were and the steps and everything, they were going down in there. But I don't know that they were necessarily going under the water, but they were washing, you know, their whole self. Um, so I'm pretty sure they would have, you know, derobed and, you know, cleaned and then came out and got all cleaned up to go into the temple. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great question. Yeah. Don't the, oh, go ahead. Don't the Jewish still have a bathing ritual that they do? Um, I, I, I believe they do continue to have some kind of ritual that way, and I imagine it depends on which part of Judaism. There's something I didn't talk about, now that you say that, Roberta, there's something that I didn't talk about, um, and this goes to the temple where they had this big, oh, I forget it, what it was called, but this big bat where they would do cleansing and the priests would do washings while they were even in the temple. Um, and so, so there was that. There was that too, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, I think Sharon was jumping in and maybe Kim, yeah. I just wanted to share an experience that I had um, years ago in our former church in the desert. Uh, when I was uh, asked to be the lay leader for the congregation, one of several things that we were asked to do to prepare us was to meet with other lay leaders um, in the in the county, actually, um, and do a foot washing. Mm -hmm. One of the most emotional experiences I've been through as a Christian, um, humbling, and um, you thought about Jesus a lot during that. I, 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 uh, I cried my eyes out, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Uh, not only doing that to a, a perfect stranger, but also having them wash my feet was absolutely humbling. And I thought, my Jesus did this, and here we are repeating it, and it was quite an experience. So yeah. I just wanted to share that. My, uh, one of my the fellow pastors uh, um, back in Lodi in my tenure there, um, uh, Gene Lebert, uh, one Monday Thursday, kind of surprised me and had me come over and sit in the chair and washed my feet. <laughs> Talk about humbling and, and yet incredibly moving. And then I've been part of another, you know, kind of thing on a youth retreat. And yeah, it's, it's powerful. Yeah. I suppose one of these days on a Monday, Thursday service, we should wash each other's feet, but it's a <laughs> bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. We do lay hands on you, you know, as a to get the touch in there. Um, Kim, I think you were jumping in and then I, others, yeah. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, you kind of alluded to it a second ago, but um, you know, we studied pretty heavily in numbers, the law and bringing people back into God's holy presence. And part of that was always after you've been separated from that presence for whatever reason, washing was always a really important thing for sanctification to get you back into God's presence. So there's that kind of connotation too. Yeah, and I don't know, I'm trying to think of the red heifer passage. I know you Yeah, did. that was the one I was thinking of where they um, have to put the ashes on and then wash them off and over a period of seven days and um, yeah. Yeah, and again, seven days, what does that connect you to? Creation, mm -hmm. right? In Genesis, so yeah, good. Yeah, no, that's an important text that I kind of, I didn't, didn't fit in there, so thank you for that, yeah, yeah. But not just that, I mean, it was after a woman's cycle, after you touched a dead body, after any of those, any yeah. of those. There were a number of things that, you know, could make you not sinful, but unclean. And there was that distinction, but yeah, yeah. So you've got both, you've got both the, the making holy aspect to where you could come into the holiness of God and then the cleaning, the being coming clean aspect too. Yeah, good. Yeah, Kathy, please. So um, I'm, I'm just curious about um, if there's any, clarification or history about infant baptisms that reaches back into the old testament 
Great question. Um, let me do a screen share here and we'll go back to our, uh, um, whoops, I just exited out of my Bible program. Uh, oh, no, evidently here it is. Okay, so screen sharing has stopped as the share window is closed. Okay, fine, but give me just a second. So I, if you've got your Bibles, um, I, I want to take you to uh, Colossians 3. I got to figure out the verse. Uh, let's see. I think it's Colossians 3, but maybe it's Colossians 2. Uh, Yes, here we go. Okay, yeah, so Colossians 2, verse 8. Um, and let me share my screen now for you so that those who need it can, can, uh, can get to that. <clears throat> and I got I to gotta move my people over to the right. There we go. So, um, Kathy's question about uh, what about infant baptism and is there a connection with that in the Old Testament? Our, the biggest one in my, um, well, I'll, I'll answer that in first. Uh, so this is just a perfect question. So I'll answer that in a couple ways. First way, um, when we think about the connection of baptism to a water crossing, and baptism as a washing, as a cleansing. Um, so those were covenant-making events. Those were like, now, like for instance, was, did they take young children through the Red Sea and across the Jordan? You better believe they did. The whole household went, right? Um, and so water crossings were not just done for the individual, but for the people as a whole. And so um, it's interesting that in Acts, we hear about whole households being baptized. And the word for oikos, for household, or the word for household is oikos and, um, in Greek. And that al always, it wasn't, that never just described, you know, the, the adults. That included everybody in the household. And so you know, Acts, when it talks about baptism, doesn't say, you know, but just the adults were baptized, which you'd think if that was a big issue, they would make clear. And here's another passage in Colossians that I think makes the connection the most to the Old Testament. And so look what Paul does here. See to it that no one takes you, this is a plural, that's why I have that capitalized, um, uh, captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. That's, that's a huge verse for understanding Paul's worldview, but nonetheless, we're, we're, we're forging on. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So look at this confession that in Christ, all the Godhead dwells bodily. Jesus isn't half God. He's fully God. And so, and you have come to the fullness in him, so we've come to God's fullness in Christ, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him, you also were, what? Circumcision. With a spiritual circumcision. By putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were, what? Buried. <laughs> buried with him in baptism. So note the clear connection here between baptism and circumcision. Now Paul calls this a spiritual circumcision. No doubt he's not talking about the circumcision, thank goodness, uh, that was done upon uh, Jewish boys on the, what, eighth day, I believe. There's another eight, which is interesting. Um, but so Paul compares our baptism to a spiritual circumcision. So 
you know, um, Kathy, a great question about, well, what about infant baptism? We hear about them doing mikvah, and, and these were adults who were cleansing themselves. We hear about all these water crossings. Well, certainly life out of death, the creation story, all of that applies to young children as well as adults. But yeah, I don't know how old people were when they would go into a mikvah to go into the temple. Um, and, you know, I don't know how that whole practice went, but I can you know, say that we know about circumcision and that happened to a baby boy. And Paul has no qualms with comparing our baptism to the covenant making event of circumcision. Indeed, it is our entrance into the new covenant. Um, so that's, so it's a great question, Kathy. Um, that's what, you know, jumped in my mind um, as a, you know, to, to refer to that. So, but but there might be others. So I don't know what other folks think or or what you think, Kathy, about that. So yeah, Gloria. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. So what about people who um believe in Jesus but they have not yet been baptized? Are they not saved? Yeah. Um, you know, <clears throat> The, the answer to that is someone who believes in Jesus, is in faith in Jesus, is certainly saved whether they receive baptism or not. Um, uh, baptism, we, now we do hear that baptism saves you by the washing, you know, or of a, but it's the faith of baptism. So, um, you know, we believe baptism does something, but God is not I don't believe God's hands are tied, you know, necessarily. But I do believe that God has, like in Christ, Jesus said, go baptizing. So this is how it works. If you believe, if you feel like you've come to a place of faith as an adult, you are to be baptized and, and believe and receive that gift. In Acts, we know people receive the Holy Spirit even before water baptism sometimes. So God, you know, this, I love what Jesus says in John 3, the Spirit blows where it wills. We don't ever want to limit, you know, God's Spirit. Um, but God, in the same breath, and I hope I'm not contradicting myself, God has said, I'm going to use water to get my work done in people's lives. And, and so, yeah, that's the normal mm -hmm. Practice, but I think we we can easily say because um, more often than anything, Jesus will say those who receive in the Gospel of John, uh, Paul will use the term those who are in Christ and those who are, um, have faith that that is a, a saving event in someone's life. But again, you know, he thankfully he's given us the gift, the sac, what for us as Lutherans, we would, and, and Catholics, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Methodists, uh, Orthodox, um, we would see that as a sacramental event where God actually does something for us. It's not what we do, it's what God does. So often I talk to our Baptist brothers and sisters, you know, who have rejected the notion of infant baptism, and they say, well, you guys think it's some human thing that you do that saves you, and and I, that's just absolutely not true. I can see that that might look that way from the outside, but, you know, faith is essential. The faith of the parents, the sponsors, when it comes to children, um, when adult, their own confession of faith, um, but we believe simply that the New Testament is much, and the Old Testament, as you can see, is much richer than baptism simply being something we do to show, hey, we believe, um, you know, um, we just feel like it, when you really read what the New Testament says about baptism, you have to go further than that. So, so Gloria, it's a great question, and it's the natural one to to come up, given we see the saving power of these waters of baptism when you put faith in God's word together with those waters. But um, we wouldn't want to limit that. Does that make sense? Well, it does. But then I wonder about those who have their children baptized, but don't bring them up in faith. What about them? Yeah. Um, the, it's... Uh, it's <laughs> um, yeah, about them. 
You know, it's sad. That's what it is. Um, it's like giving someone a million dollars and not letting them know they have it. That's the way I would say it. Um, I, I do believe that since, let's say it's an infant, that they are brought into Christ, um, that that is a powerful, important comfort and strength. But, um, you know, I'm, Lutherans have this thing of confirmation in seventh, eighth grade or ninth grade or tenth or whenever it happens. We have, you know, the Apostles' Creed every Sunday where people are called to confess their faith. Um, so, you know, ultimately, like some people would say, oh, well, I baptized my baby, so I know for sure they're going to be in heaven, even if they disregard God and they just, they have no faith as they grow up. And that's where I say, I, I can't say that for sure. I don't know. Um, um, that's, that's kind of, a, that's between God and the person and, and we'll, we'll lean on God's grace and mercy uh, on that one for sure. But um, it's, it's a sad thing you know, when that happens. And that's why, you know, I mean, there's been a few times and it's only been a few times where there's been a situation where, you know, it's a, a parent who was like, you know, I'm only doing this for the grandparents and the grandparents are not going to be involved. I've baptized plenty of babies when the parents are not Christian or not practicing or something, but I know the grandparents going to be a force in their life. Well, that's no problem. I want somebody to be able to tell them the story so you know um but but that's where you know i'm supposed to rightly administer the sacrament so i you know we have those promises in the baptismal rite. i've been amazed how many parents promise to bring their child to the services of god's house and don't but you know that's it's sad let's just say it that way but i also understand it. people really struggle today with faith and church and for all reasons and everybody's got their journey but yeah so that's that's what i would say to that question you know uh, pastor bill in that light if if we're if we're receiving the gift of faith even just as a kernel at that point of you know that's um the baby receives that as a gift and then that's what the parents help unpack and grow and the holy spirit works on that faith so i mean who knows when the Holy Spirit might work on that for that Abs Absolutely. Absolutely. Maybe it's not till they're 50 or maybe it's, you know, but absolutely. And that's why I say, you know, I'm, it's very rare that I wouldn't do a baptism, but, you know, and a couple of times I haven't, uh, I think I can count them like in three, <laughs> like there are three or four times. And, and I know for sure two of them, I regret not not doing the baptism now so um but yeah absolutely and that's why we do that because we want the covenant to be given to them and we want that to work in their life and that gift of faith and you know so because we believe it's god's grace that saves us and so baptism is the beautiful expression of that um yeah 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 um yeah Mr. Bill? yeah please um I keep thinking of the words that you say you have been marked by the cross of Jesus and it. And then I hear that once you've been marked, he does not let you go and he'll send other people in the pathway of these babies. Probably if the parents aren't doing what they said they would do. That's yeah. My, and, and, and that's the hope and prayer for sure. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Good. So how about for you guys, as we go through challenging times, as we go through our ordinary everyday life, um, this question that came up about what's the background to baptism and what's, how did people understand baptism at the time of Jesus? There's no question that, that Jesus, our Lord, transforms baptism, takes it to another level, and yet at the same time, it does the same thing that it did in the Old Testament. But he certainly, you know, it's a one-time thing now, one faith, one baptism, uh, uh, you know, like a once-for-all washing, like 1 Peter 3. Um, so, you know, how does that help you in this life? Um, how, you know, I don't know if anybody wants to chime in on that one.
I, I would just say that the, um, I think it's comforting to see the history of our faith and how far back it goes. And it kind of gives you um, more of a sense of God's overarching plan, you know, that, I mean, and you, you look back at what the Israelites went through and, and, uh, you know, <laughs> they've had a lot of ups and downs and it, mm -hmm. it just kind of puts the things that we face into perspective, I guess, of history. Yeah, no, beautiful. I, I love that, that it's, and this is a little different than you shared, Kathy, but what kind of the light bulb that came on when you were sharing that is like, wow, in my baptism, it connects me to those people who were taken out of slavery in Egypt and crossed the Jordan and, you know, all those stories that that's, I'm a, I'm a part of that big story. Yeah. Very cool. Um, uh, please, Mary. Uh, oh, I was thinking that um, um, in any way that the children can uh, come to Jesus, you know, they say, let, let the children come to me. So, even if they were, were baptized and their parents didn't continue with them, we still need to let the children come. Yeah. And so maybe, um, you know, because we just didn't know I'm living in later, you know. So probably baptism does give you that extra little bit. In the older baptismal rite, in a lot of the older Lutheran, hymnals. I think it's still the case in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod hymnal. They have that text in their baptism liturgy, let the little children come unto me. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. yeah. Now, mm -hmm. our Baptist friends would say, he wasn't talking about baptism, and you know, but given what we believe about baptism, it makes perfect sense that we would say, we would read that passage, you know, don't mm -hmm. hinder the no, children. Don't keep some away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good, good. You know, um, I know we're at a love, we're at our time now, but um, I, uh, I guess, uh, and I know maybe that I hope this isn't a broken record because I don't think we can ever hear it enough. But um, I think there's, I think as important as our commitment is, our surrendering to God, our following Jesus, our laying down our lives, our washing other people's feet, our loving the neighbor, our spiritual practices of worship and prayer and praise and thanksgiving and, you know, uh, giving, and stewarding what God's given us. Um, as important as all of that is, uh, I love what I get from going back into these Old Testament passages is that um, my assurance in my life and my hope, what I cling to is not what I do. I mean, you know, because my belief falters. My sincerity falters sometimes. I have good days and bad days. I have ups and downs and um, I do things I don't want to do and think things I don't think and sometimes the things I want to do I don't do and you know um, as important as all of the Christian practices are um, what I get from this and what I get from my baptism is that when I face whatever challenge comes my way, and when you face our challenges, um, we cling to the fact that we've been taken through the water, that we've been buried, and we've been get brought out of the water. Uh, that's certainly um, when we've got someone that we love so much in a ICU room like we do today with Terry. Um, it's, or, you know, or we lose people like Bud Price recently, or our, our parents, you know, like we just go on and on. Um, when I'm at the, you know, deathbed at somebody, 
you know, some Christians will say, well, have you been a good enough Christian? Do you believe? Have you really surrendered your life to Christ? And how mm -hmm. that we're going to point people to what they've done in this life to give them co consolation and hope? You know, no, I, I'm not going to do that. If, if, I'm, <laughs> if I come and visit you, I'm not going to talk about, you know, well, do you... And you know what's really ironic is when Luther was passing away, um, what some of his friends said, do you still confess the faith of the church? And, and Luther said, yes. But I bet you Luther was going, are you guys serious? <laughs> I mean, really, you know, um, what Lu one of, the last thing Luther wrote is we are beggars, you know. I mean, that's, now that's, you know, that, that's where you go. You know, we're completely dependent on God taking hold of us and taking us through the water and putting us in the promised land. And, and so that's what we do um, every day. Um, when we're facing challenging times, we go back to our baptism and say, hey, God brought, used water. I was baptized, whether I remember it or not. And God, you know, brought life out of the waters and he's done that for me. And he's given me even a mustard seed of faith. And, and now, um, you know, he's put me to death. My old self has been put to death, and I need to just keep putting it to death every day by confession and forgiveness, which is the gift of baptism. And um, I've been, I've had a water crossing, and now I'm in a new covenant um, that, uh, you know, where God remembers our sin no more, um, and he's placed his law upon <laughs> So, so that's, I think that's what's really powerful for me when, you know, so I thank Bob for this question, even if I didn't exactly go where he was thinking, but I think maybe I did. Um, that's, that's what, uh, that's what this is about um, for us in baptism. Um, you know, yeah. All right, good. Well, um, I think what I'll do is just close us with a prayer today. Um, and, um, you know, God knows the prayers of those who are on our hearts individually. And so we'll just, I'll have a little time of quiet. Um, so, you know, the spirit can intercede that way. And then I'll close this in prayer. So let us pray. Gracious God. Um, Thank you for our baptism. Thank you for that Jesus has continued the, the process of your using water with your word to make new. And thank you that we have been baptized into a new covenant. And um, so we pray, God, for all the people on our hearts today. We especially pray for Terry. Um, we pray for Lisa, who's having surgery this morning. Um, we pray for Jerry, who's recovering from surgery. Uh, we pray for, um, for everybody's needs that are in this Zoom class and those on Facebook today. We pray for our nation. Uh, and we pray for a peaceful transition of power. Um, we pray for um, those who are tr protecting that transition. And we pray for those who would want to disrupt that. Um, and use violence um, as a means to an end that they would be stopped. Um, so we, no matter what, um, and so we pray God for our nation in this time and our world as we battle COVID, um, as our county has more cases than ever right now, as our schools go back into in, to some degree in person, pray watch over our teachers and our students and and we pray for the vaccine rollout and that that can get running more smoothly and get out to more and more people um, and so that we can have that protection. So, you know, the groanings of our hearts, Lord, and we pray this trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. And God's peace be with you all, okay? Thank you. You are welcome. Appreciate Thanks. you guys. Love you all. Yep. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a blessed week. Thank you and goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.